First of all, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Let's have a great talk. All right. Picture the Senate of the ancient Roman Empire. Debates rage over war, circus games, and taxes. But imagine that your patricians can walk in and shout their discontent in the middle of the assembly. Instead that, in your case, heated discussions revolve around your millions of lines of code. And instead of just patricians, anyone can walk in. And instead of walking in, they log in across many platforms all around the world at any time. Imagine that amid that chaos, you still have to make something great that competes with what your wealthier neighbors can achieve, even though they have basically a hundred times the workforce. And if you fail, everyone will boo you and move to those neighbors. How does it work? Well, it's a little crazy, but how it works is also why it works. Hi. I'm Nathan, I'm the founder of GD Quest, a company where we teach game development with the Godot game engine. Uh, we're contributors to the engine, we make you know, open source demos, communication, things like these, we help them. If you don't know Godot, it's a free and open source 2D and 3D general purpose game engine. Um, it's currently one of the biggest projects on GitHub, it's certainly the biggest uh, game engine project there. Um, and um, it's a pretty complex program with over two millions of lines of code. So how did the developers get it to work? Well, it started like almost every other open source project. Uh, initially, it was the in-house engine of an Argentinian game studio that was released open source when the company closed. Um, it had a slow start in 2013, as it was still a bit niche. It was very promising, but lacked some features and some of the polish you find in larger commercial software. It grew through word of mouth until 2020, where the activity around the project got really overwhelming, actually. Um, at this point, the organization of Godot had to evolve and is still evolving to this day. And we'll see, you know, all the things they did to make it work. You know, um, at first, you, um, in open source projects, you're typically alone or, you know, with a small group of like-minded, technically inclined people. So you don't really need communication guidelines. You can follow all the activity around the project um, and you can focus on just coding cool new features. Typically, you won't have budget either at this point. At scale, it gets trickier. Um, Godot currently has tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of users. We don't know exactly because it's open source. We don't track users. Um, but it has thousands of contributors, literally. Um, when you're that big, you can't keep track of all the conversations that happen around your project. They become decentralized and disjointed. People start to use all sorts of platforms. They'll just use what they prefer. So they might be on Discord, on Reddit. You know, in China, they might use a WeChat or things like these. Um, so you have to give up some control. You can't keep track of everything. The participation to open source projects is free. Anyone can make contributions, right? So uh, as a result, you can't really have something like a company culture, at least not a very formal and unified culture across everyone working on the project. Um, on top of that, um, because open source technologies are commons, they don't belong to a single entity, the users feel a strong sense of ownership. They feel like the project becomes part of their identity. So they expect some level of horizontality in the way you make decisions, and they will certainly voice their desires about the project. There are entire systems and uh, literature on building, running, and scaling companies, but there's not so much for open source in comparison. In the case of Godot, as with most large open source projects, the ability to deal with growth is very much a set of skills and solutions that matured on the battlefield in response to the rising chaos. I have no magic recipe to give you, but I'm happy to highlight some of the challenges that eventually caught up with Godot and some of the hard-earned ways that the team learned to organize and even thrive in the chaos. We're going to 
start by talking a bit about budget. You know, how do you raise funds and do a lot on a shoestring budget? By definition, when you create free and open source software, you don't make money by directly selling the technology. So this limits who and how uh, you can ask for money. As you grow, you will likely keep lacking funds and you should expect to have one to two orders of magnitude less budget to work with than you know, the larger companies you're competing with. So you have uh, to learn to do a lot with a little to keep costs down. Um, in particular, I'd say it's pretty hard as an open source project to get money until you're already successful. Uh, for Godot, it took years of benevolent work from some of the people who are uh, here tonight with us. Initially, you won't get too many uh, financial sponsors. Um, companies, the larger ones, don't really put money on open source projects unless it's worth it for them, like it's cheaper if they just sponsor the project to implement some features. And uh, this means that early on or as you grow, you can't really just throw money at problems. You need to be efficient and make the best use of your resources. How did Godot do that? Well, by first keeping the core small at first. You really want to include the features that answer the biggest needs of your target users and prioritize them hard. One thing that you can do that's really valuable is have a very strong plugin architecture. Um, this gives you less maintenance as the core project, and this allows users to add the features that they are missing from you. Um, on top of that, you know, if some projects become really wanted by the community, very well tested, you can always turn them into official plugins or then use them as a source to implement in the core technology once the design is ironed out. You want to also be smart with the reuse of your user interface and user experience design. Uh, in Godot, the UI part is perhaps, you know, 80, 90% of the code base. It's a gigantic amount of work. And so what the developers did is they made smart decisions early on to find pieces of interface that would solve the problems of many users. Maybe, you know, not in the absolute best way for each group of people, but they just didn't have the budget to do that. So uh, that's something you can leverage as well. And finally, you know, early on when you're getting started, uh, people will be happy to work for you um, if you cover their living expenses. You don't have to compete with the salaries of much larger companies. And, you know, Godot um, had some people working on it like this out of passion, though, of course, as you grow and have more budget, you want to pay them better. Uh, and this is how things have been going for the project. You know, another thing you might want to do, uh, of course, is slowly find ways to increase your revenue. So a couple of things about that. Uh, first, you need to acknowledge the importance of sustainable revenue. Uh, if as an open source developer, you can work full time on your project or even better, hire people, get a team to work full time on the project. You will just go much faster than if you're doing it on the side. Uh, for that, of course, you need money. You need to cover your living expenses. Uh, but the problem is that, you know, you're already developing software. You have to do hard work and you have way too much work to bother with looking for money. Um, you will also likely, for a long time, not have any budget to hire money people, people who can um, look for funds for you. And you certainly can't invest the, donor, the donor's money in that when you're getting started because people want you to invest in the product, in the features. I don't have a great solution to that, but I will say you can explore the various sources of fundings that we have here. Um, and try to find the ones that feel most comfortable for you. Godot uh, and ASL GD Quest, we've used pretty much all of them um, at different times and different levels. So donations is typically the one that most open source projects start with. You ask people to chip in. Uh, the thing I'll say about that, you know, donations from individuals, is that it's not so far uh, so different from crowdfunding if you want to make it work. You need to do marketing, and the community needs an incentive to donate. That is to say, they want to know why uh, you need the money or how it will be used. 
You can offer products and services related to your project. So that's what we're doing at GDQuest. We make paid training material. There are a bunch of open source projects that also do that or offer cloud services or things like these. Um, of course, building these takes time away from the project. So you want to find something that synergizes very well and really allows you to free time to work on your technology. Crowdfunding is I would say a different form of collecting donations. So instead of collecting them over time, you run a campaign and uh, you try to leverage or raise a budget over two weeks, four weeks, and just, you know, this allows you to focus on building the technology uh, afterwards on a specific work package. Um, problem is it requires a lot of preparation and strong marketing, but if you manage, then you are free to just Focus on the tech uh, afterwards. Corporate sponsors um, are going to invest in your technology, as I mentioned, if it's worth it for them. So in the case of Godot, you know, when they saw it growing, Microsoft uh, funded work on C Sharp integration because you know it's kind of their programming language. Uh, we have had, or the Godot team has had Meta support the VR uh, extended reality side of Godot, and so on. Um, you have subsidies that vary quite a lot depending on where you live. This is really something to look at uh, based on your country, based on the state you are in. Uh, it can be a great source of money for anything related to research and development that you can use pretty freely. Finally, venture capital funding is uh, something that can be pretty foreign to open source people or free software people. It requires a very strong business model, but typically you can uh, create a service that is based on top or revolves around a core open source technology and find investors that would be interested in it. There are people who are specifically interested in funding open source projects. And veterans from the Godot project have been doing that. They founded two different companies, W4 and Ramatak, um, where they make services around Godot and use some of the money to really accelerate the project. Um, it's very important to produce learning material for your project, but you know how do you do that when you don't really have much budget to spare? Um, well, first let's look at how uh, the state of a growing project. So as you grow, you will get all kinds of users. Um, and high quality learning content is really crucial to keep these people using your technology, your project. If you don't have enough learning material, people will just quit. It's that simple. Uh, at the same time, producing comprehensive learning material is very time consuming and, well, takes some level of expertise. To address that, you should encourage the developers in your project to uh, document the features that they add to the technology. They are in the best place to at least uh, draft an outline or something you know, of what they worked on. You really want to keep your user manual up to date. And yes, users may not read the manual, but the people who are going to teach those users, the teachers, the content creators, are going to use that as the source of truth for teaching. Um, another thing you can do is create a cookbook. The Ross programming language has done that with great success. Uh, cookbook is a collection of individual recipes that exist typically as standalone pages. They are very easy to contribute to and uh, for the community to make. When it comes to learning material, you really want to adapt to your users and simplify the learning. Even if you're making a tag for developers or whatnot, um, you have to keep in mind that there will be beginners interested uh, in using your technology, and it's certainly the case with Godot, people who have no programming experience. And if you help them grow with the technology, these beginners will, years from now, be become power users and help other people learn. So they're instrumental to your growth. Um, I would say you can, you know, you want to try and use the appropriate tools and platforms to develop the learning material for technologies. 
Um, as developers, we're very com comfortable with version control systems like Git and all, um, but you know, people writing content, the teachers, they may not know about that and might be much more comfortable with some collaborative, real-time um, uh, tool to write docs. So you should be open to letting them use that. And if you're worried about the quality, you just need someone to do quality control in your team. You know, uh, go after them, ensure that all the information is correct, and you'll be good. You can also provide them with some tools. Uh, there are things like a language tool for open source options or Grammarly for a paid option that check the grammar, those kinds of things to make the style kind of consistent. Uh, last tip here, you really want to advertise uh, the learning material of your technology on your website, on social networks and whatnot. Anything you don't tell the users exists doesn't exist to them. It's that simple. To be successful and grow as big as Godot, you need to promote your project efficiently. So visibility is really crucial for project growth. Uh, but of course, it takes your time to do that as well. Uh, if you don't do anything in that area, you will grow through word of mouth, which is slow and uncertain. Uh, and as I mentioned before, you can't really use donations you get uh, in the project for marketing, communication, promotion. Again, people want you to invest in the core technology and the product, right? But I'll say, while well, lots of free software open source people can be sometimes reluctant uh, to look at promotion and marketing. Um, the thing is, doing it well accelerates everything. It allows you to get more users and in turn more opportunities to grow your budget and accelerate your project. Um, there, you know, you don't necessarily have the time to do all that yourself, so you really want to work with your community. Um, you want to work with content creators in your community. There will be people happy to share the word about what you're creating for you. So we do that at GQuest. Uh, we have friends, other channels around Godot, Heartbeast, Game From Scratch, that have grown pretty big and that cover Godot. Um, together with all the YouTube channels around Godot, we probably brought around 100 or upwards of 100 million views to the project. You also want to empower contributors beyond just coders, tutors, marketers, artists, um, you know, all these people would be happy to help you and they have skills that you may not have in your team. Uh, to these people, you really want to provide goals and information about, you know, your roadmap, your mission, the direction you're going in, and then you don't want to micromanage them, just let them do their work, they know what they're doing, um, and um, you really want to seek help from the community for design and marketing, which too many open source projects don't do. They focus on the development side, making a great product, and miss opportunities for growth. When you create something like Godot, uh, you really want, well, to communicate well to people, that's marketing, but also you want your program to be very easy to use. Godot has a whole user interface where people can make games, and you want a great, to offer a great user experience. You want people to enjoy working with the program. How do you do that without data? Because typically you use analytics, um, metrics, to kind of see what people struggle with. But with something open source, you typically can't because people are very privacy, privacy conscious uh, in our communities. At best, you will be able to offer opt-in telemetry, but you won't be able to gather tons and tons of data on your users, and Godot certainly doesn't. We just know the download counts uh, for the engine, and that's about it. Um, the way you achieve that is by first developing an intuition for your audience, because you don't have numbers, you will need to engage with your community. I mean, go out there and have conversations with them, on the different platforms they are, on social networks and all. Um, you might want to scan those communities because you can't be talking with everyone. But also, you want to ask the people who are very invested in those communities, like a Discord community, a Reddit, um, people on YouTube, content creators. You want them to bubble up you know, the things that come back again and again about your technology, the problems that people encounter, and this is how you improve the user experience over time. 
There are also some effective questions you can ask people when you engage with them. So first, you want to know about who they are to get a sense for what they are doing, what they are trying to achieve with your project. And there are three very effective questions that we use at GDQuest. Um, we ask people, what's your goal you know, with the technology, with Godot? How will reaching your goal change your life? So this is to get a sense for how involved they are, how important this is for them, you know, and what's currently preventing you from reaching that goal. What are the obstacles in your way? And these will really help you get a good sense for what people bump on, you know, and how important those things are for them. Uh, we talked about getting people who aren't developers involved in the project. How do you do that? You know, you have a great diversity of users and uh, skill levels. Um, and a challenge often for these people is, you know, uh, Git, the version control system that most of us use on open source, is a great technology. It's very powerful, but it's also pretty complex. You know, not everyone can use it. Uh, as developers, we can be so used and comfortable with these technologies that we forget that there are people who know nothing about code, common line, uh, or the kinds of platforms that we use to collaborate on development. Um, you really want to meet users where they are, those non-coders. And an example of that is uh, the Blender 3D program. They have a community called Right Click Select, where people can just engage in discussions and like share proposals about new features they want or workflows they would like to have in Blender. They can vote on these projects and this is very simple for them to use. There's just a discussion portion of things uh, and not much more. Um, of course, it's a bit of a you know, dedicated platform that they have. Um, at Godot, you know, the team uses GitHub. Uh, one tool that GitHub offers that you could use to get started is called GitHub Discussions. It's a discussion channel that you can turn on on your project. Um, so this can be a good option. On top of that, I would invite you to proactively ask the users that are not active on development platforms, especially professionals. You know, if you want insights from seniors, from busy people, from artists and all who might have excellent insights about your technology to push it forward, you really need to go out and ask them, and they will be happy to take the time uh, to help you. Um, when it comes to open source, as your community grows, you know, you start to get people with very diverse backgrounds, very different perspectives on the project, political views, and so on, and this can lead to conflicts and miscommunications at the same time. Um, Let's talk a bit about bad miscommunications because they happen both ways. So on the one hand, you have users who come to your project and they might have valid ideas or things they struggle with but express this very poorly. Very often they get uh, not necessarily shut down but you know, dismissed a bit. There, there are rarely people really helping, helping them express things better. Um, the developers in open source projects typically answer people directly, but they will not be trained in communication or, you know, community management. Um, at the same time, um, you know, as developers, we can assume too much about the users and just um, assume that someone who is actually very experienced in, I don't know, user experience design um, is just doesn't know enough about the project or whatnot and we know better and it's just, no, we're not gonna do that, it's not a good idea. Um, these things result in unnecessary conflicts and lots of friction in uh, public open source projects. Um, you can, help soften that problem by creating guidelines that produce a positive environment. Uh, you can invite everyone to first stay on topic. We're here to talk about tech, right? Uh, but also ask questions about people. So when something is unclear or something, ask a little question, you know, what do you mean by something like that? Do you mean this thing? You know, uh, rephrasing people really helps them feel understood, feel that you care, uh, and move the discussion forward. Um, you want to provide a private channel for tough issues that will inevitably arise. There will be uh, conflicts at some points. This is very important that people have someone to contact specifically to resolve these privately. Um, 
you also want to train your team members in conflict resolution. So this is done through asking questions. Um, you really want people to learn to rephrase what the other is saying. Again, if people feel that you care, you will remove a lot of frustration, even if in the end you say, no, we're not going to do that. But, you know, finally, you want to monitor the stress of your team because when there are conflicts, uh, people can get stressed. You know, as a developer, you, you can get irritated by someone who's angry at you or things like these. And it's really good when you have someone in the team who can uh, take over and answer peacefully when you know there's already a lot of anger rising. How do you select the features to add to your tech? Because you know users want everything, but you can't do everything. Um, <clears throat> each feature is going to add more maintenance and tech depth to your project. And the way you choose them, the way Guru does it, is, well, first you want to communicate your constraints transparently. You know, you can't do everything, so it's completely fine to tell users uh, we have, you know, each feature has a certain cost, takes a certain amount of time, and we have a roadmap. We want to prioritize that, and we have good reasons to do that. Um, once you communicate that clearly, people understand it. Um, at the same time, you want to ensure the features that people request solve real and clear needs. You need to prioritize these features based on your roadmap. Um, and it's also very important um, to know which features are very important to observe your community rather than ask them directly. Um, because you have to be careful when you uh, send messages on social networks asking what people want or you know, kind of trying to see what is the, the kind of consensus. You will have very noisy or influential people that will skew the answers towards uh, certain things that they want. Um, how do you make sure that people trust you, you know, that you have a good relationship with your community? Well, you know, trust is very easy to lose, but it's everything. Um, you have to um, be able to show that you're working in the project's best interests, and for that, users need to trust your words. The way you do that is pretty simple. You don't make promises you can't hold. Uh, there was this project called the, the V programming language, and the guy made very bold claims. It took almost two years for him to undo those things, like just undo those claims, and he was... Um, you know, very genuine about wanting to make great tech and now it's going well, but, you know, it backfired big time. So you want to be like doctors. You want to say, you know, we'll do our best. You don't need to, to say more than that. You don't need to, to uh, assure people that they will get this or that feature in the program. How uh, do you communicate your vision to your community um, when the conversations, as we mentioned, is completely decentralized and asynchronous, you know? Uh, everyone will have a varying understanding of your project, your mission and whatnot. You can't possibly communicate your vision to everyone, but you can try and you can um, try to get most people on board and in sync with you. To do that, you produce a very clear and short mission statement. You know, you want to have a very clear picture of what your mission and your goals are. Uh, and you need to repeatedly share that across channels and over time. Uh, then, once you've done that, you can trust your community to spread the word. So, that's it, you know. Um, <clears throat> there's one last point that's very important. You know, contributors get very deeply involved in open source projects. Um, they pour time and energy in your tech and they get a very strong sense of the, the tech, like Godot being part of their lives, part of their identity. When you reject their contributions, they might feel rejected if you don't do it carefully. To avoid that, you want to make your contribution process and the project roadmap very clear. You know, it's your project, your rules. It's completely fine to have um, the ability to say no. Um, you can just tell them that the rejection is not personal. How do you do that? Well, again, communication training is very important. Just answering kindly, we really appreciate your contribution. Uh, it's very nice, but you know, it doesn't follow our guidelines or you know, it doesn't fit our roadmap at the moment. Um, so thank you for the work. Next time, don't hesitate to come talk to us um, uh, to see if this is something that's needed right now. 
uh, we'll be happy to have you participate again. People will really appreciate that. Uh, so kind and empathetic answers, right? Um, it doesn't mean that you have to write very long messages or write unique messages each time. You can use templates that you adapt to the person. Um, you can link to, to guides or things that they might have missed as well regarding how to contribute to your project. And, you know, open source, it's unpaid, but it's not thankless. Uh, it's messy, but it's gratifying. It's not easy, but it's possible. It's, uh, Godot is yet another proof of that following Blender and many others before it. As someone who's been active in both, you know, the game dev community uh, and the free software community, I feel, you know, there are many game developers here and I feel there's significant overlap between the game dev culture and the kind of culture we need to support the development of large free and open source software. Uh, is our community uniquely placed to contribute to free software? I like to think so. Thank you. <laughs>